This is the 40 Thrive Podcast, Episode 7. You're listening to the 40 Thrive Podcast, the show created for women 40 and beyond, ready to shake things up. Get exclusive access to expert advice, support, and strategies that will inspire, motivate, and give you the tools to not just survive, but thrive. And now, your host, Jackie McDougall. Welcome to the 40 Thrive Podcast. I am grateful you're here. So today's episode is going to really shift your mind when it comes to nutrition and exercise. Courtney Townley is the founder of Grace and Grit. She has a community online. She's also got her Grace and Grit podcast, which I will link to in the show notes. You need to take a listen. But I met Courtney about a year and a half ago. It was one of those moments where I showed up for a podcast conference and they had a little opening intro for those who had never been before. And so I went into the ballroom and sat down at the table and we just all started talking as a group. And across the table was this woman who I could already tell I loved her energy. I loved the way that she showed up and she just had so many really great things to say. And so it was like one of those moments where you glance at each other across the table. And I was like, I need to be friends with this person because she is a no BS, yet super kind, thoughtful, caring, nurturing being who I love having in my life. And I know that you're going to love hearing from her as well. Courtney calls herself a mover, shaker, and healthy people maker. She's been working with mostly women for the past two decades in helping them heal their relationship with their bodies. And while she's been doing it a long time and she has seen the evolution of her clients and her students, Courtney has also experienced her own evolution. So to go from a fitness trainer who was feeling like crap, who felt like she was anything but well on the inside to somebody who really knows what her body needs and wants and teaches the rest of us the right way to look at health and wellness and fitness. I'm just really excited to give you this opportunity to hear from her with her refreshing, unique, candid way at approaching life over 40. Courtney, thank you for joining me. Oh, it's always such a treat to be with you. I'm so happy to be here. So I was just telling the story. It's usually reserved for people who meet their soulmate at a party and their eyes meet (laughs) across a room. And for us, it was across a table at a podcast conference. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) And I just, it's so funny though, because we weren't in a position where we could really talk to each other right away. We're literally across the table, but I'm like, she's my person. Like she's I need to know this person just from like these opening exercises we did. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? I I really have met some of my favorite people in the world that way. It's crazy. And it's so exciting because then you flew out for my very first event last March for 40 Thrive. And people are still talking about your way that you approach fitness and nutrition and all of it in such a holistic way that... I couldn't even imagine anybody else being one of my first guests on this podcast because (laughs) I'm telling you, everybody, you know, it's 2019. People are like, this is the year I lose weight. This is the year I look like Jessica Alba or whoever, J-Lo. And if you are looking to drop that 30 pounds by listening to this episode and doing nothing about changing your life, this is not for you. This is not for you. So what I love about you is not... The fact that you teach people how to get in better shape or to how to lose weight or whatever it is, is kind of a byproduct of what you're actually teaching. And that's why I'm such a fan because you're actually, yeah, you're teaching people how to change their lives. So enough of me talking, let, tell me, how did you get into this field in such a unique way? You know, it's so funny. I think the work that I teach is really like everybody's work to some degree. It's an evolution, right, of my own journey. And I I was a former dancer. I was in the dance world. And if anyone knows anything about the dance world, it's not super lucrative. (laughs) What? (laughs) When I was in college, I was literally teaching butts and guts classes. You cannot make this up. uh, At like 530 in the morning before my classes started. And I, I really enjoyed teaching people how to become better movers. 
So when I graduated from college, I continued to teach fitness classes. I got a bunch of certifications and I was still dancing, but using fitness as um, sort of the way to pay my bills. And I, I just got more and more involved in it, more inspired by it. Um, but I also got to a point where I realized that addressing everything from a movement perspective was not enough. You know, that people could come and work with me for one, two, three hours a week, but it really depended on what they were doing outside of their time with me that made all the difference. Right. And I honestly what just wasn't armed with how I could help them on that level. And so around that same time, I was having a lot of um, my own health challenges. I was having, um, I had had several miscarriages. I was trying to get pregnant. I was super lethargic. My joints hurt. My digestion sucked. Like I just generally, for someone who looked so fit from the outside, I felt like hell. And I ended up hiring a health coach myself. And I worked with her for almost two years. And I was so bowled over by how many missing links there were in my own process that I couldn't possibly go back to just teaching movement to my own clients, right? I had right. to like teach them the whole enchilada. So for the last 12, 15 years, I've, I've really been sort of teaching um, women how to build a better practice of self-care from a holistic standpoint. And I would say right now where I am in this current stage and phase of my career is that I, I'm just so much more uh, passionate than I've ever been about the mindset piece because I don't really care what it is you're setting out to change about your life. If you are not thinking about it in a way that promotes change and promotes growth and promotes perseverance, mm -hmm you're not going to be very successful with it. So right. I can talk to people all day long about the foods or the way of eating that might promote their goals, you know, help them get closer. Or I could talk to them about all the, you know, um, ways we can exercise to, to change physiology. But if they are not changing their mindset at the same time that I'm teaching them that information, it's not really going to matter because 100%. they're not yeah. So you, a couple of things that you just said that I want to touch upon. Number one is just to go back a little bit, you were teaching these courses, you probably looked amazing. Have you noticed that people would rather follow somebody who looks great, even though maybe they're falling apart inside, they're not feeling healthy or well, they're not taking care of themselves, they're not sleeping They're You know, how many times have you gone outside? I Ex an exercise class and you see the the instructors out there smoking having a smoke or you know drinking yeah. a soda or something it's it's where we live in such a culture where people are more interested in following somebody because of how they look uh. than how they're actually living yeah. So two things I want to say about that. First of all, people are always really surprised to hear that about a third of my clients are actually coaches and trainers. Interesting. Yeah. And they're, they're my clients because we've all, like, I, I was that trainer too, who, who looked from the outside, like I had everything together mm -hmm. and who on the inside really felt horribly ill. Um, and, and I, and I definitely attract that clientele. So the trainers, the coaches who are working themselves with the ground, who are preaching all these wonderful things about health, but aren't really doing the work will end up hiring me to help them get straight. Um, with, and what I mean by getting straight is lining up with, you know, what they, who they're representing in the world with the actions they're actually taking. Right. Um, and the other thing is, I think you're spot on. There's such this pervading message that our health is determined by how we look. And that mm -hmm. is total BS. It's not true at all. I mean, I know women and I've worked with many of these women who are a size two, you know, tiny as can be. They look like they're, you know, healthy and fit, but they only poop, you know, once every two weeks and they have, <laughs> you know, horrible headaches and they're super irritable and they have all these joint pains and weird, you know, issues in their body. Body. So just because they don't have a weight issue by no means says that they're a healthy individual. Right. So I think, I think we do get very skewed about what health actually means and how it's represented. Right. So, you know, take me back a little bit. So you decided to hire a coach, which no matter what it is you're trying to do in your life, I am a firm believer in finding a coach or a support system, a community, whatever it is that you need to help you stay accountable and to teach you some of the ways I, I can't even say enough about coaching when it's the right coach for the I'm right reason. Yeah. So talk to me, you hire this person. What do you think? I mean, you already knew a lot about nutrition and exercise mm -hmm. and how to move. What did, what do you feel like you got from this person that you didn't already have? 
Yeah. So, I mean, she, it, can I cuss? Can I? Yeah, yeah. go for it. Okay. Be you. <laughs> she basically called me out on my shit, right? Mm. So she, so I came to her and I said, look, I'm a trainer. I do all the right things. Like something must be really unique about me to have all these problems that like, we need to figure this out. And she said, okay, like you're telling me that you're doing all these things. Show me. So start tracking it. Let's start being accountable okay. to what you're actually doing. And oh my word, like that first week of tracking, <laughs> I did not want to turn in my homework, <laughs> right? right? Because I was looking at it like, oh, this isn't at all what I thought I was doing, right? Like I could already start seeing the gaps in my own behavior by just starting to track my behavior. Interesting. So of course, you know, sh I showed her my, my tracking of my exercise, my food, you know, all these things that she asked me to track. And and, and I, and I kind of knew what she was going to say in a way, because I knew it wasn't what I thought it was. And she basically just started working with me from there to basically fill the gaps. And, and this is what I say to my clients all the time. Like, I don't teach my clients things they don't know necessarily. I mean, sure. I'm definitely a little bit more educated in, around nutrition and physiology than most people. So I can help them understand that better. But most of what I teach is stuff that people have heard a thousand times. The problem is there's this very large gap between knowing something and actually doing it. <laughs> and if pe people were being really honest with themselves, just because you know something about what's good for you, that's not enough to make the change. You need to constantly apply it. So the place where people really have the biggest challenge and where I had the challenge is I wasn't being consistent. Mm -hmm. And so I learned how to be consistent um, in a very methodical way. So I wasn't overwhelmed and I could really apply what I was learning and it made all the difference in the world. Wow. So you work with a lot of people in finding this consistency, but I think you nailed it right from the top and you talk about mindset. So I'm still back there when you hired this coach. What would, there are so many coaches who would let their ego get in the way. I am a I am a fitness expert. Why would you give yourself that grace, you know, founder of Grace and Grit, to actually turn to somebody else for support, admitting that you maybe don't know or have it all going on? Yeah, well, I didn't know it at the time, but I would say today, looking back, I, I think people who are really serious about making change are willing to ask for help. And at the time, and I didn't know this then because I was like 28 years old. So I was, you know, a lot younger than I am now. Mm -hmm. And I distinctly remember I had this handful of women, there was like five or six of them. And I had been working with them for a long time. And they all went through this period where they were radically changing before my eyes. And this is going to sound like crazy, but I knew it wasn't because of the work they were doing with me. <laughs> because I had been teaching people fitness for years, right? And I had seen some changes for sure, but not like these ladies because their whole persona was changing. They were more optimistic. They were, you know, they had like light in their eyes. Their hair was healthier. Like life was just better. And so I asked them, I said, what the hell are you guys doing? Because <laughs> there's clearly a pattern here. And they were all working with the same woman. Really? Yep. And so I was humble. And, I mean, I was able to humble. I was very humbled in that moment. Right. Like, okay, there's clearly some stuff I don't know. There's some clearly some, like some missing links in my own education. And I am willing to um, go get that help, not just for myself, but because I was into the industry and I'm so committed to helping women. Right. And so it was, it was really kind of a win-win. I helped my, myself with my own health. And I also ended up helping a lot of women over the years because I was able to admit that I just didn't know enough. Right. And, and like you said before, it's not always about knowledge. Sometimes it's just about the accountability or the collaboration. You know, yeah. I, I find, especially as a fellow, you know, work from home mom, that it's very easy as women, whether you're leaving the house every day and commuting or staying home and taking care of kids, it can be very isolating. Yeah. So what we were doing maybe in our 20s and being more social as life gets in the way, we become a lot more isolated, at least many of us do. And so sometimes we just live in that, in that space of like, I have to figure it out on my own. There's nowhere else I can turn. But in actuality, nine times out of 10, there is. So I give you a lot of credit for not coming across or not approaching the situation 
as I'm an expert. I Nobody can help me. I'm just going to put my head down and trudge through. You know, I love that you reached out to somebody else for help. Yeah, I think I've always had a voracious appetite for education mm. um, and for improving my own life. Like, I think that's a pattern that I had from really early on. But I also have to say that, like, just that willingness to reach out to this health coach and ask for help, it has served me in so many ways in my life. Like, at this stage of my life, I have a movement coach, like I have a trainer that I've worked with for years. Um, I have a business coach. I, I have, I've worked with a therapist. I, I look for people who can help me to get to where I want to go in the straightest line possible. Right. Because I know that if I do it myself, I'm a smart cookie. I can eventually figure it out. But do I want to take that kind of time and, you know, you know, life is short. So yeah. the answer is largely no for me. Like I want to figure this out because I want to live my best life as soon as possible. Right. And so I hire people to help me all the time. It's an investment in yourself. Yeah, it is an investment in yourself. I have a, I have a student who just graduated from my year long program and she just re-registered for the same program at the same price. And I said to her, I was said, you know, there's a lot of other ways, you know, you could work with me. Like you don't necessarily have to do that whole program over. She said, no, I want to, because I see how dramatically it changed my life. And I'm starting to understand how valuable this accountability piece is and having somebody who's just traveled a little bit further ahead of you in this certain arena that you're trying to approve. She goes, I can see the value of having that in my pocket. And so to me, it's totally worth the price. That's fantastic. And, and it says a lot about you because, you know, if somebody is coming into a program, there are different phases. So yeah. you work on where you are in that moment and what you need, but there's always more to do in that area. So I love that she recognized the fact that she could go through the same steps, but from a new place to get to the next level. I love that you're bringing this up because I think when it comes to health, I see one of the biggest mistakes a lot of women make is they're reaching for complicated measures from the outset. Mm. So they're looking for the complicated diet that has all these rules and regulations or this really aggressive exercise program or this whole complicated supplement regime or really intense detox program. And while those things may have a, a, a place in somebody's journey, it's usually not at the beginning before somebody has built a solid foundation of the basics. And the thing that really advanced practitioners understand is that the gold is in the basics. And I find a lot of women kind of have this attitude that they're above the basics. They're beyond it. They already right. know that stuff. And so they need something else. When in reality, they've never been consistent enough with the basics to get the results they're looking for. That is such an incredible point because I'm going to admit right now, I am that like, what's the next greatest cleanse? What What's the, you know, oh, is that a Spartan race I can train yeah. for? You know, I mean, I'm not like, how about you walk the dogs on a regular basis without like turning to Facebook instead? I mean, just start there, you know? So I love that you're calling people out on that because I do love a challenge. I love a goal. Yeah. And one of the things I love about what you have out there in social media, and I'm sure with your clients, you set these goals. I have to make, I have to admit something to you. I took a picture of you doing a handstand <laughs> from your social media and yeah. put it on my vision board. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. Not because I want to be Courtney Townley, although yeah. that would be a great goal to be, but it, it, that to me was indicative of strength. Mm -hmm. and a goal and something physical that's fun and playful. It's yeah. not drop 40 pounds. It's not eat like a bird. It's, you know, it, it's something that, okay, now I want to do a handstand by the end of the year. What are the steps that I go through to get there? Yeah. That's where my head is at now, instead of that person who wants to grab onto the latest and greatest. Yeah. There's what a phenomenal, you... let me say this first. There's a, yeah. there's a phenomenal uh, research, uh, obesity researcher. His name is Yanni Friedhoff. I followed him for years. And he has studied all the ways in which people lose weight, but are able to keep it off. And what he said in an article I read last year, which I thought was so on point and so awesome, is he said, you know, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. There's a lot of ways that you could um, get a person to lose weight. There's a lot of systems and methodologies that work. 
But the number one underlying factor that determines if somebody is going to keep it off for the long run is how much they enjoyed the journey. And this is why I encourage my clients all the time, you have to find ways of falling in love with the work. Because if you don't, as soon as you get to that goal, guess what you're going to do? You're going to stop doing the work. Right. And then guess what you get? Right back to where you started. Right. So then you have to start over and over and over again. So what if instead of teaching people to chase a goal, a result, we really taught people how to fall in love with the work? That's great. That's great. Right? So or how do you- at least befriend the work. <laughs> Maybe not fall in love, but at least befriend it. At least invite it to a party, you know, do something. Um, so how do, you, how do you do that? What would be your tip to helping people fall in love with the work? Maybe some of the people listening aren't necessarily going to go and sign up for a gym and go and do, you know, CrossFit uh, for the next six months, but what are some ways that people can fall in love with being more active? So I just interviewed um, Ingrid Fatel Lee. Um, I don't know if you know her. She wrote the book Joyful. She's an interior designer and she basically makes spaces really joyful. But something she said uh, really struck me. Um, And she said this, she said, I really, she really encourages people to do what she calls joy spotting. And joy spotting is noticing the parts of your day, the things in your day that light you up right? Maybe it's a, like a splash of color that you saw on a wall, or maybe it was the way a kid laughed or like, I don't know what it is for you, but there are things in the day that light you up. Mm -hmm. And and with your health journey, you, first of all, we have to be really careful about the way we talk about the things that honor our health. So when someone says to me, I hate exercise, like to me that like, it literally hurts my soul. (laughs) (laughs) I think, you know, okay, let's take exercise. Maybe let's change the word. Do you hate movement? Because you you might be telling yourself in that you're in in your head, but I am telling you from a physiological standpoint, your body adores movement. So what is it about your life that has made you believe that you hate movement? You know what? I can tell you right now why it is. It's because you put it in a little cookie cutter box called exercise that you have to do X number of times a week in in a gym you hate being in. And so, of course, you say something to yourself like, I hate exercise. Right. So what if we could just start joy spotting the things about movement that light you up? Like when you chase your kids at the park, does that make you feel good? When you go take a dance class, you know, with your husband on a Friday night, does that light you up? There are moments of movement in the day that I know spark something in you in terms of like actual enjoyment and lighting you up. And if we can start noticing those things and doing more of those things, eventually like you're going to be moving your body a heck of a lot more. And that is truly what the body craves. It's not about exercise. It's about moving more. Right. And you spoke about that at the 40 Thrive event back in March. And people were like, hold on, there is a nutrition and fitness expert at the front of the room who is just telling me to move my body more. She's not telling me to join a gym. She's not telling me to do 500 squats a week. She's telling me to move. I I think what is incredible about your approach, you give people permission to have a good time. So wh- how, how is that? What, what is a good time for you when it comes to physical? Is it going for a walk with the kids? Is it going to yeah. the playground and trying to do the monkey bars? You know, is yeah. it um, dancing? Is it, you know, there are so many different ways we can move our bodies. It is. And I'll tell you for me, um, I, I love, I just love movement. I always have. I mean, again, I was a dancer. So I'm somebody who's just always really had such an appreciation for moving my body through space. And here's my ultimate goal. I want to be able to go into any environment or any class. And I don't necessarily want to be the best person in the room, but I want to be able to hold my own. So therefore, I use strength training and cardio as a gateway to build a robust system to allow me freedom in my body to do whatever the hell I want, whenever I want. That's such a great way to look at it. Yeah. So exercise is not the end. It's simply a door. It's a beginning. That's all it is. Right. That's fascinating because that's really what I think the mind shift that really makes exercise a lot more palatable for some 
is that you are doing this to become stronger so you can live in the way that you want to live. Totally. So it, yes. we know that movement is important. We know that what we put in our mouths is equally, if not even more important. But what I love as far as your approach is it's not about the nutrition and it's not about the exercise. It's what starts in your brain. Can you mm-hmm. tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, I think a lot of us get caught up, you know, in this space of, I say, I call it integrity pain. And what I mean by integrity pain is we say that something is really important to us. Like I, I want to be healthier, right? That's really important to me. And I really want to get control of that this year. But a few months or a few weeks into the year, like right about now, mid January, mm-hmm. people are starting to recognize that even though they really feel that this thing is so important to them, their actions are not actually saying that that's true. Their actions are not in line with what they say they want. So there's right. this really horrible misalignment. And so we like we get we get caught up there for years and it sucks. It's a very painful place to live. And so we have to stay curious about who we are and why we do what we do. We also have to stay curious about why we don't do the things that we say are important to us. And, you know, largely when I ask women to start looking at like, okay, you scheduled exercise in your planner today, or you, or let's just say you scheduled a walk and you negotiated your way out of it. Well, there's two things that probably happened there. Number one, you're probably someone who has made a habit out of negotiating exercise for years. So it's just habit. That's right. all it is. It's a habit. It's a way of behaving. There's, no, no, there's not necessarily any rhyme or reason to the way you're behaving that way. It's just a pattern you've practiced an awful lot of. So it's a habit. But second to that, I bet there's something you're saying to yourself in that moment about that walk that is preventing you from doing it. I'm too busy. I don't have time. I'm tired. You know, I, I mean, I, I, the list goes on, but these are the types of things that they seem so insignificant. Like that's just not a big deal. It's such a small thing. But, but when you hear that, when someone, t- when I hear myself say I'm too busy or I don't have time, I immediately do not want to take action around whatever that thing is that I said was important to me. Right. So if I can catch myself doing it in the moment, like, let's just say I have that walk scheduled. I catch myself trying to negotiate or rationalize my way out of it. I just ask myself, Courtney, how can I support you here? What would you need to think in order to actually go do this thing? And you can't lie to yourself. It has to be something honest, right? But I can remind myself that, you know what? Every time I go take this walk, every day that I come home, I feel more productive. I feel more energized. I feel more excited about life. That right there is going to get my butt out the door. Right. Because there... Nine times out of 10, actually, I would say 10, 10 times out of 10, when we move our bodies in yeah. any way, we feel better after. Always. Unless you're somebody who's, you know, struggling or suffering from an, uh, an illness or an ailment. Like this is, this is in general. But I always come back going, oh, I'm so glad I did that. But yet that muscle of resistance before I do it is so strong. How do I, how do I loosen it up? I mean, I just remind myself of those results. You have to remind yourself and you also have to just learn how to dance with resistance. Like I just, I was just talking to someone the other day and I said, you know, it's so funny. We, even after all these years of realizing that, you know, motivation is not standing by our bedside every morning with a cup of coffee. Like we wish it was, but it never is. Who is there instead? Resistance. Mm -hmm. That's who greets us every morning. She says, you know, oh, these are your plans for the day today. Let me tell you why you're not going to get that done. Right. (laughs) Or let's focus on this instead. Right. And, And I think when we can learn how to just expect resistance and learn how to start leaning into her a little bit and realize that nothing catastrophic is going to happen. And, and here's, here's the, here's the truth. Every single day you are going to choose a level of discomfort. You can choose the discomfort of staying the same, which has absolutely no benefit for most people, except that you know what to expect, right? Like that's probably the only benefit. Or you can choose leaning into some discomfort, which is largely around resistance, no matter how you feel doing the thing anyway. And that discomfort provides tremendous benefit on the other side. Right. Not just after one day, but after several days of practice, you start reaping the reward of leaning into that resistance. So I always remind myself, Courtney, you, you get to choose your discomfort. Which level is it going to be? You want to stay the same? 
You want to stay frustrated. You want to stay in a space of always telling yourself you're going to do better, but never do. Or are we going to get uncomfortable by going and moving our body today, even though you're a little bit tired or even though you have a lot of things on your plate today? It's amazing though, that that all the things on our plate that are so important and the reason that we can't move our bodies are often not nearly as important (laughs) as moving our bodies. Yeah. You know, we tell ourselves the same stories. You know, it's like if I'm working all day long and the kids get home from school, well, I can't go for a walk now. They need help with homework. No, they don't. And if they do, guess what? The homework will still be there when I get back mm-hmm. and I'm happy to help them. So as my kids get older, I, I'm poking more holes in my stories. I love that. Because when they were younger, it was so easy to use them as an excuse to not to not practice self-care with myself. Yeah. I love that poking holes in your story because I think that's what everyone needs to do. Like everyone needs to like literally look at the story that they have written and really just go through it with a fine tooth comb asking constantly, is that true? And how's that working for me? Right. Because largely it's not. (laughs) (laughs) Clearly. And this isn't even just with nutrition and exercise. This is with so many different areas. I do a program a few times a year called the Reboot. And we, for six weeks, we just kind of like take stock of where we are, where we want to be, and then create a plan to get there. And the one thing that I hear over and over again is like, well, I just wasn't motivated. I didn't have the, I wasn't inspired to take action or whatever. And it's baffling to me. I read it a long time ago and it's just stuck with me. It's baffling to me that we all think that motivation comes first and Mm -hmm. then action when in actuality... Action. action and then motivation. Yeah. So anything that you want to do, whether it's declutter that we're doing in the group right yeah. now, right? A little little challenge there. You don't need to be motivated to declutter. You just need to start. Yeah. The motivation comes when you start to see results. Yeah. It's so and, true. And how long does it take? You know, you work with these people who some of them maybe are pretty, um, don't they don't move so much in the beginning and mm-hmm. then they start to incorporate movement into their lives. I mean, we all talk about habits and how long it takes. When, you know, in general, when do you see that change in the mindset from somebody who just keeps pushing through, pushing through? When does it click? I think it's, I think it, it's different for everybody. I think I see varying, I see different levels of, um, of I, I guess, proficiency in a way. Like, so what I mean by that is I usually see a woman start feeling better within a matter of days. If she starts really making a plan for herself and showing up for herself, it's amazing the difference 48 hours can make. Wow. But if we're talking about creating deep, meaningful change and really building a practice of self-care, I'm really sorry to disappoint people who are listening. You're not going <laughs> to like my answer, but I would say a minimum of six months to a year. Wow. A minimum And this is why, ladies, like all of these like 30-day programs and 21-day detoxes and and three-week boot camps, you have to keep doing them over and over and over again because you're just following rules and regulations. You're not really building a practice. A practice is like brushing your teeth. Every day you get up to do it because you know the benefit and you don't get caught up in the drama of why you don't want to do it. You just do it, right? Yeah, yeah. But And what if we could look at our health in the same way? Like, these are the things that I know make me feel energized and perform my best, my best. So why on God's green earth would I not do them? Right. This is a little bit on the darker side, but I, you know, I had, I have a, a gene for breast cancer, the BRCA gene. I don't know if you're familiar. So I had surgeries back in my thirties. They had found a lump and all that. So, it, you know, I'm 47 now, but I had a hysterectomy at 35. I've been through a lot of challenges physically in that way. So for me to think this way um, that I'm about to tell you is is pretty reasonable. But I was thinking the other day, if I continue to live the way I'm living right now, not in general for the past year, but right now in January, overwhelmed, trying to juggle it all. The kids were home for what felt like a year and a half for, for winter break. <laughs> I know. I get that. If I continue to live the way I am today... There's a possibility that I will either not be here in 10 years or not be well while I am here in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm not, we see it all the time. And it doesn't mean that if you 
really care about yourself and self-care and nutrition that you don't get sick. I'm not saying that because there are plenty of people who do all the right things according to what we think are the right things and still get sick. Yeah. But I'm just saying that whether it's diabetes, whether it's cancer, I have a gene for cancer. Why would I not do everything possible in my day-to-day self-care to prevent that from happening? Mm -hmm. Because we all know sugar, lack of movement, you know, all of it, stress, Lack mm-hmm. of sleep, all of these things contribute to our wellness or our lack of wellness. And so I just, you know, we can talk in lighthearted ways of moving our body and this and that, but I want to get real here. Mm-hmm. Most of the people listening to this podcast are women over 40. We may have 40, 50 years left. We may have 10. How mm-hmm. are you going to live? I, I go to Disneyland sometimes with the kids. And I see person after person after person overweight and in those scooters. Many of them are probably overweight because of an illness that got them there or whatever is happening. But many of them are ill or in the scooters because they're overweight. And I just, I'm making this commitment right here, right now with you, Courtney, that I don't want to be that person. I'm not saying I want to look like Jessica Alba or J-Lo and I want to do a Spartan race, although that does sound kind of fun and challenging. I want to live in a way that makes me feel inspired and badass. Mm -hmm. And that includes eating well and moving my body. Yeah. So what I just heard in all of that is you have a very clear and very expansive definition of what health means to you. Mm -hmm. And yet think of how you're measuring your progress. Oh yeah. A a scale. A scale. A scale that you just named it, right? And this is what most women do. They have this huge, expansive definition of what health is. And and then they use something that has really nothing to do with that definition to define Mm -hmm. if they're succeeding or failing. And then we wonder why we don't stay motivated, right? And I'm not saying that's the only reason. Right. But my point is you have got to have markers of progress that are truly in line with everything that you just said. And here's why. Because I run into this all the time with my clients where I will have women who do everything like at the most elite level to take care of themselves, right? They're drinking water. They're getting enough sleep. They're eating a great diet. They're feeling like a million bucks. They get on that damn scale and all of it's for nothing because the scale didn't move. Right. And I think, what? What? Like, stop it. How can you possibly say that? You feel so much better. And here's the other thing we have to know. When we are changing our health, we are literally changing from a cellular level out. And that takes time. Right. It takes time to see the results, but most people are throwing in the towel because they're not getting the results quick enough. So first of all, I would just say that you have to make sure that you're, the way you're measuring progress along your journey is truly in line with your definition of what health is. But secondly, I think one of the places where a lot of us get into tr- trouble is this all or nothing thinking. Absolutely. So we get in this place of saying, okay, I'm committed to improving my health. So Monday morning, I'm going to prepare, or on Sunday, I'm going to prepare all my week's worth of food. I'm going to go to the gym six days a week. I'm going to get to bed an hour early. Like we overhaul our freaking life overnight. And then we wonder why we can't sustain it. And it's no wonder. It's like a little kid trying to read a book. And instead of teaching them the alphabet and then how to string words together and sentences and paragraphs, you just throw a book at them. Right. And say, here you go. Good luck. And then ridicule them totally. when they can't read. Totally. And berate them. Yeah. And the, the the talk that we tell ourselves, yes. you know, we sabotage ourselves because yes. we're not good enough and whatever other things that we're saying. You would never say that to that child who couldn't read the book. Never. And, and here's the thing I want everyone to hear. There is absolutely nothing wrong with you. There may very well be something wrong with the system or the process you are trying to use in order to create results, right? And and, and this is real, like if you really look at the science of behavior change, our poor little brains can only handle so much change at one time. And it is a hell of a lot less than you'd like to think. So, you know, I tell people like, 
if you think of compound interest, I put a little bit in the bank every single week. And like after a couple of years, it's really exciting to see how that's, you know, grown. And that's how we have to think about our health. If I make just one healthier choice today, if I move my body just a little bit more today and go to bed a little bit earlier today, and I keep making that choice of doing a little bit better, that is going to compound over time. And in a year, I'm going to be a totally different person. That's but true. that's not, that's not a sexy sales pitch. And that's, and people do not, you know, a year seems like a long time, but I'll tell you this, everyone who does my year long program is like, I can't believe a year is over. Like, whoa. And it's like, well, okay. It did not take you a year or a couple weeks or a couple months to get into the state of health you're currently in. It took decades. And so for you to expect that a year is a long time to start unraveling that, it's just unreasonable. Well, I remember talking back when I was in my 20s and I was working in TV and I had a co a coworker, a colleague who was talking about, um, they were turning 30. It's so funny now I hear this and I'm like, this conversation, you know, oh, if only. Um, <laughs> and they were turning 30 and they were very upset that they hadn't hit certain points um, in her life by the time she was 30. And I said, well, what are some of the points you want to hit? And to travel, to do this, to do that. And I said, okay, well, you're going to turn 31 whether or not you do this stuff. So maybe just be a year behind. Maybe just start now. Like stop gauging the fact that all these things that you want to do had to happen by that age or you are a big fat failure. Yeah. You know, maybe it's at 30. That's when you started to do all the things that you wanted to do. Like yeah. it's okay to change the script a little bit. Yes. And so I love your encouragement of your clients and just your general social media community, your podcast community, to just live a better life. Yeah. You never come across as like, well, let's do 10% of our body weight or 10 <laughs> pounds by Valentine's Day. Like, that's yeah. just not who you are. Right. You are saying, how can you authentically, aligned with who you are and what you truly want in your life, live in a way that feels good? And yes. guess what? Weight comes off when you do that. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. And, and, and I'm not, I, just, I just want listeners to hear this. There's three questions I really encourage women to ask themselves frequently. Okay. First and foremost, how's that working for you? <laughs> right? So if you're going to sit here and defend to me how you eat and that it, you, know, you can't possibly change it, fine. How's it working for you? Is it working in like, is it moving you closer to where you want to be in the world? Is it allowing you to be who you want to be in the world? If you can answer a strong yes to that, keep doing it. But if you cannot answer a strong yes to that, you better be willing to get in the ring with trying some new stuff on. Okay. So how's that working for me is a powerful question. Okay. Another question I love just to ask yourself frequently throughout the day, like you're talking to your best friend and your best friend is you. How can I support you? What can I do for you right now? Right? Like just ask that of your body. Like I have to tell you, Courtney, that is my signature line with my kids, with my husband, with my my clients, with my students. But not with yourself. I've never asked myself. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit emotional about that, but I have never asked myself, how can I support you? Yeah. Amazing. And like, how awesome would that be if you started? Because again, our body, of course, our bodies are communicating with us all the time, but we never stop to ask. Like our bodies, here's what I think is amazing no matter how shitty you treat your body, it shows up for you every day. You mm -hmm. woke up this morning breathing. You can love, you know, hug the people you love. You can provide for the people you love. And yet we, we treat it like it's this horrible thing that is against us. Right? It's the enemy for many people. And so my question is, how's that working for you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how can I support you? <laughs> and so my, my, the third thing I would ask, I tell people to ask themselves, is anything that you take on in order to improve your health, I want you to ask yourself, will I still want to do this six months from now? Because if you're only willing to engage with it for a couple of weeks or you can only see yourself doing it for like a, a month, then it's probably not the measure you need to take. That's great. So look for things, that, again, that joy spotting, right? The things that light you up, the things that you know are easy enough that you, yeah, I can do this. Like, this is not that hard. But the, 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 the problem I think a lot of us are facing is we're just getting ourselves into commitments that are way too big. We can't possibly sustain them. And then we're feeling like a failure when we aren't a failure. It's just the action was way too monumental. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. So I had joined a gym last summer. Absolutely loved it. Got but between July and the end of the year. Actually, it was the summer, the summer before. Um, between July and the end of the year, I fit in 100 workouts. They had like a little punch card thing. It was plus I love a good challenge. So I was all about, oh, I have to go that many times per week. I want to get my yeah. punch card, you know. So I was showing up four times a week, sometimes five times a week. I truly loved it. I felt stronger. I felt amazing. And at that time, my son, who has a chronic illness, um, was having a lot of flare-ups. And so when you have appointment workouts that cost you a lot of money, probably more than your budget actually allows, and you can't go and you're being charged anyway because of... So ultimately, I put that on hold, but... It was fascinating because I went from, I am digging this, I could see myself doing this forever, to I'm not doing anything. I was depressed. I was bummed. I made this choice. I I was happy with the choice because I knew I had to do what I had to do as a mom, but there was absolutely no reason I couldn't take what I had learned and moved it into my own home or maybe a place that was a little bit more flexible for where I could show up. So... What do you say to people like me, because I know I'm not the only one, who it's like here, it's all X amount of dollars, way too much money, you know, but in love with it versus I'm going to do it in my own garage and never showing up in my garage to do it. Yeah. Well, this is kind of that, that like we were talking about before we started recording, this is that space, finding that space between grace and grit, Mm. right? Where another way of looking at it is um, creating structured flexibility. Like what are the things that you know are your anchors in the day that, that always make you feel better, that aren't that difficult to do? Like for me, one of my anchors is that I have to get a decent amount of sleep. Like no matter how much is coming at me in my life, I just need to put myself to bed at a bedtime and get up at my regular wake up time the next morning to feel human and to feel grounded. That is an anchor for me. And there are very few situations where I truly can't put myself to bed. Now I could choose not to go to bed at a certain time, but it's not that life is forcing me to stay up, right? It's me doing that. So there are the structures that I never really negotiate. But then there's the flexibility side of my self-care that I have to be willing to extend grace to myself to be flexible with because I can't always go to the gym as much as I want to. I can't always push as hard as I want to. I can't always, you know, eat in the way that I want to. You know, like if I'm if I'm really getting detailed about my food, I can't always do that. So that's where I'm willing to be a little bit more flexible. But even though I can't necessarily maybe eat as dialed in as I want to sometimes, I'm still going to eat real food. Like I have commitments within that that still allow structure to be there. So I just love that phrase of structured flexibility because I think it allows me to remember that there's always something I can do, but I can't always do everything to the extent that I want to do it in. Right. Right? That's such a perfect point because – I could still have shown up in my garage during those times, those hours, maybe get a neighbor or a friend to join me or my husband, but not necessarily feel bad about myself for not being able to commit to what I was once committing to. Yeah. And also recognizing, because I hear you speaking to this, that self-care doesn't always look the same. And this is where we get it really wrong. We always think self-care looks like exercise and diet. Sometimes sometimes self-care looks like taking a freaking nap. Right. Sometimes self-care looks like going to pee because you've been holding your bladder for two hours. <laughs> get out of my head, Courtney Townley. Yeah, right? Sometimes <laughs> self-care looks like recognizing that, oh my gosh, I'm getting irritable and I can't focus right now because I haven't eaten in four hours. Right. Right? And I think that if we're just willing to ask that question, what does self-care look like right now? Right now, in this moment, what does it look like? Because it probably doesn't look like push-ups and kale. <laughs> Right? Thank God it doesn't. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's funny. And that's so true because I think we put so much pressure on ourselves that things have to look a certain way. And so that's, again, one of the things I really respect about you is that you look, there are things that are non-negotiables in your life and in and that's what you encourage your clients and your community to have these non-negotiables. But at the same time, providing yourself that grace, that whole grace and grit. I mean, you live 
Grace and Grit. This is not a brand that you've created that now you're trying to put your life into. It's like you are an example of Grace and Grit every single day. And it's it inspires the rest of us to try to live in that space as well. And I really appreciate that about you. And here's the thing, like, and this is what I really want women to hear. I want you to hear. I want myself to hear yet again, is that we have done ourselves a little bit of a disservice by allowing the diet and fitness industry to brainwash us into thinking that someone always knows better, that someone else knows where that fine balance is for us between grace and grit. But the reality is you are the only person who knows where that balance is and you have to take responsibility for it, which means you have to be willing to experiment. You have to be willing to try some things on. You have to be willing to accept that progress is not linear. Right. And if you're, and get to know yourself and get to um, that place where you start asking yourself some really good questions and you, you commit to becoming your best, even though it's probably going to be messy along the way, Mm -hmm. you know, rather than constantly looking at to other people to tell you how to live your life. You know, I think that it's, it's really great. Like I love being a health professional. I love guiding women. Um, But I always remind them that the only expert on your physiology is you. Because I'm not in your body. I don't right. live in your body. I don't live your life. I don't have your likes and dislikes. I don't have your genetic blueprint. So at the end of the day, you have to learn how to communicate with your body so you can you know, basically honor your body in the way that it's asking to be honored. And that requires honesty and it requires paying attention. Right. And I love that because there are so many people out there who are com- completely convinced that what they know about you and what you should be doing in your life, like that they are the the keeper of the secrets. (laughs) And and, you know, I think their intentions are good a lot of times because something changed their life. And so now they want everyone to know and everyone to do that thing. And, 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 and of course that's what gets them into trouble, right? Is that then people buy into it and it doesn't work the same for them. And it's not because there's something wrong with that person. It's just because we're all so unique on so many layers that we don't fit into these cut cookie cutter protocols. We never will. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're doing something exciting in with your brand this week. You have the five to thrive event going on. What does yes. that mean? Yeah. So, you know, it, it, and it kind of, you know, just kind of a summary of everything we've talked about. Like, mm-hmm. I really believe that women make this getting improving their health stuff so difficult. Right. Like we, we get in our own way on so many levels. We reach for programs that are really setting us up for failure. And at the end of the day, even though every woman is so stinking unique, um, there are a lot of common threads that run through everybody's health journey. And these are things that are at the root of what I teach as a coach. And so I'm running this free event um, that basically introduces these fundamental principles that I really believe every woman cannot come back to often enough. Like, I don't care how advanced you are. I don't care where you are in your health journey. If you're willing to come back to basics and master the basics, that's where the magic is. And so that's really what the event is, is it's just reminding people of the mainstays of deep health. And and, and I basically advertised it this way. I'm not teaching people stuff they don't know, but I am just reintroducing the ideas and teaching some physiology and science behind why it's so important for these things to actually happen. Uh, And I'm also giving some tips and strategies for how to make it much easier without creating overwhelm. I love that. And this is all online? It's, yeah, it's all online. So if people register, they can go to graceandgrit.com forward slash five to thrive and just enter your email. And what will happen is you'll get an email with a link in it and you'll click on that link and you'll have access to all five days worth of lessons, all the Facebook live Q&A sessions. You'll get a little workbook that you can kind of track your own thoughts about what you're learning. But it really just kind of brings women back to the stuff that matters, like the fundamentals of, of what you can do with consistency that will make all the difference in your health. Um, and, and of course, and again, I just want to emphasize this, there is that very large gap for most of us between knowing and doing. And, right. and this is just kind of my attempt at slowly starting to narrow that gap for women. Well, I'm excited because I think anybody who's looking to narrow that gap and just get their head back on in a positive, productive way in moving forward with their health the Five to Thrive event. I, I, I'm I going over there and signing up yes, for it, Courtney. you should. Absolutely. So I encourage the 40 Thrive community to join me there. <laughs> so before you go, 
one of the things I ask all of my guests. Yes. I'm putting you on the spot here. Okay, good. What does it mean to you to 40 thrive? Oh, that's a good question. So for me to 40 thrive, I think it, I think it really, for me, um, it means being willing to stand in the ring with my own bullshit, you know, and to be able to just not judge it, but just see it for what it is, you know, and realize that if I'm not willing to look at it, it's going to continue to control my life in a way that isn't serving me. And so for me to thrive, I have to be willing to kind of lift up the rug and look at the dirt underneath. And, and I honestly, I've done a really awesome job most of my life avoiding that. <laughs> uh, and there's some things that have happened in the last like, you know, four to five years where it just really wasn't an option anymore. Like I knew that for me to be happy and feel, feel fulfilled and free and creative, I needed to address some things. Um, and, and as terrifying as that is, and it's not work that anybody wants to do, you know, it's not fun, but the benefit on the other side of it is profound. Um, and so I just, you know, invited myself into that arena without the judgment and with a whole lot of compassion. Um, and I, I reached out for help, right, to people who could help me move through it. Right. And, um, and, and I, are, I just feel like I'm in such a position to thrive through my 40s because I, um, yeah, because I kind of know what I'm traveling with. Like nothing is a mystery to me <laughs> in terms of kind of my behavior, you know, like I'm willing to look at it. I'm willing to stay curious. I'm just willing to get to know myself and own who I am. And, and that's what it means to thrive. That's a great place to be. And I encourage everyone to look at their lives a little bit more honestly, because as you like to say, how's that working for you? When you pretend yeah. that things are going a certain way and you're not getting honest with yourself, I just don't think that you can be the person you truly are meant to be. It's such a prison, you know, and I think we have this delusion that, you know, because of social media and, you know, media in general, that other people have their shit together, but everyone has dirt under the carpet, everybody, you know, and I think if we were just more willing to talk about it and normalize it, it would just do so much good for the world, you know, for all of us to just say, oh yeah, me too. Like, that's okay. This is what I did. Maybe it'll help you, you know, but just really kind of like throw it out into the open rather than trying to hide it in a closet. Which 100%. I think is what we and do. I think that, you know, when you have an online business, it can be even easier to pretend that there's no dirt under that carpet. So I give you a lot of respect and admiration for leading that conversation. That's what I'm hoping that 40 Thrive is for people, where the days of pretending that there's no dirt under the carpet are over. That's yeah. ridiculous. How do you live that way? Because yeah. you're so worried that somebody's going to come over and lift up the carpet. Mm -hmm. I would rather just show you like, hey, there are actually crumbs under there. <laughs> And it takes a lot of energy to hide that, right? To like yeah. stuff it and hide it and not open up about it. it. Like it requires a lot of resources from your physiology and your and your psychology. And it causes and, shame and it yeah. causes depression and anxiety and that need to try to pretend you are someone that you're not. And none of that is good for anybody in the world. No. No. So if we were willing to just look at it and kind of expose it and shine some light on it and get to know it, like it's amazing the amount of freedom that's on the other side of that because we aren't fighting it so much to hide it anymore. And so I think, that, you know, I see this a lot in my industry, of course, because women have, I work with a lot of um, very accomplished women, women who have achieved very high levels of success in their life um, at the expense of their health. Wow. And yeah. so they have horrible shame around this lack of self-leadership in the arena of health. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. And, and, and it's nothing, I mean, it, to me, like, I'm so inspired that like, you know, these, most of my clients are over the age of, you know, I'd say late thirties to, to late fifties. Um, but that they're at a point in their life where they haven't thrown in the towel, like they're just getting started and they know that this is something they need to address in order to move forward. Awesome. So head on over to graceandgrit.com slash five, the number two, thrive, and join Courtney's free online event. I'm excited to head on over there. Courtney, thank you so much. Oh, it's my always a pleasure. pleasure. Yes. I, every I time I it. talk to you, I just want to like go dancing that night or go do something <laughs> fun. Okay, or next time I'm in LA, we'll go dancing. Absolutely. Okay. That sounds perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much, Courtney Townley. If you found value in this episode and you know someone who might benefit from this message, please consider sharing the podcast. Uh -huh.
subscribe to the 40 Thrive Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Next week, you won't have to go searching for the podcast. It will just pop up in your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to join us in the 40 Thrive Facebook community. We've got some great things happening this month, so join us over there on Facebook. Thanks so much for listening. Take care and keep thriving. Spring has sprung, and with the change of seasons, sometimes comes an increase in vitality. If you're feeling in the mood for a little more personal time, may I suggest Coconut. Coconut is all about providing clean and natural ingredients when you're enjoying your most intimate moments with or without a partner. Naturally safe products developed by people who are obsessed with quality. Get 15% off with promo code GROWNASS at grownasswoman.guide forward slash coconut. That's 15% off with promo code GROWNASS at grownasswoman.guide forward slash coconut.